joyous Friday. Now, I'm going to be spending all of today with a book written by a very dear friend of mine called Mango Brains. And it's uh, by Ann Oldman. Um, whoops, I didn't call it the machine. Did. I call that machine, by the way, the devil tool. It, it knows I don't like it, so it does things like this. It's not Connor, it's not me. The machine just knows who I am. Now, back to Mango Rain. Um, this is really quite an extraordinary book in many ways. Um, the uh, grand opening celebration was here at Story and Song, and Anne gave a presentation. It was really quite an enjoyable occasion. It's where I got my autographed copy. See, that's one of the benefits of Story and Song. Um, and just a little bit about the book. I'm going to read you uh, encapsulated a, a brief paragraph that puts you in the frame of where things are happening and what the story is about. But I'm only going to read two chapters. And before we start, doesn't that cover give you kind of a feeling of the tropics with that bird of paradise and the glistening uh, cover? It's really quite evocative. But a little bit about the book itself. Young American Julia Galbraith arrives in the seemingly peaceful capital of Cambodia during the season of the mango rains, short showers that uh, presage the more violent monsoon. As she falls in and out of love, she is caught up in the maelstrom of political crises that will change the world and Julia for ever. Now, a little heads up, I do want you to be aware that my uh, pronunciation is a tad quixotic, and there are some foreign phrases here, so I may be approximating the correct pronunciation, but my heart's in the right place. In the opening of the book, I need to share this with you. She takes a quote from Robert Frost, and says, happiness makes up in height for what it lacks in length. And now, the first chapter I'm going to share with you. It's Dead Heart of Africa. It won the second prize in the F. Scott Fitzgerald Short Story Contest in 2012, which should make you realize that Truly, even though a, this is basically a nova, novella, a short novel, um, the chapters in books oftentimes can be taken in their entirety as a piece of work, and then they fit into the broader context of the piece of work. Remember, I read you just that marvelous first chapter in The Grapes of Wrath. Well, I'm doing a similar thing with this. The Dead heart of Africa. From Julia's journals, all the chapters start from Julia's journals. Note from Bill Harper on their Christmas card. Tom Grant was named ambassador to Chad. Sheila must be making life hell for the other officers' wives. The dry season in the south of the country began in October and hot desert air from the north descended on the capital, which was named Fort Lamy for a, a dead uh, French soldier killed in a battle just across the Shari River. The country was Chad, often called the dead heart of Africa, for its landlocked status and for the fact that except for a small belt between the capital and the marshlands of Lake Chad, it was a desert. Appropriate that he should be ambassador here, thought Tom Grant, as he sat in a cafe on the quay and sipped a Pernod and watched the sun set over the river. One dead heart deserves 
another. When he was nominated for the ambassadorship, he was thrilled. Even though it, it was a chad, it was some sort of a recognition of his work. A reward for a, a lifetime slogging the trenches in the third world. He thought Sheila would be pleased. But her face fell when he told her. She had long since given up pipe dreams of being posted in London or Paris. But she'd hoped for a Washington tour. And Fort Lamy, with its poverty, squalor, and hot climate, was just one more cross for her to bear. He thought she might at least enjoy being the ambassador's wife, even in a small town. But the foreign service had changed, and the other embassy wives were no longer expected to uh, kowtow. None of them had the time or inclination, anyway. His deputy's wife, a French anthropologist, spent most of her time in the field. The public affairs officer's wife drank and reportedly slept around, though he was no longer to mention such picadillos in the officer's fitness report. Not that he would have. Jack was a nice old guy desperately trying to counting out the years to his pension. The economic officer was a single woman who had quite correctly resisted Sheila's attempt to treat her as an embassy wife. The admin officer's wife, an accountant, worked full time running the budget and fiscal office. Sheila might have made friends among the small diplomatic community, but she'd never learned French, their common language. The sun disappeared behind the low mud brick buildings across the river in Kusiari and Cameroon, and Tom laid some money on the table. Here, so close to the equator, you know, sunsets didn't linger, and Sheila was expecting him. He had suggested they go out to dinner for her last night at Fort Lamy. French hadn't done much good in their six decades here, but they had left some good restaurants. But she had refused, as he knew she would. When they first arrived, Sheila had gotten sick after dinner at La Parisienne, the best in town, and since then had never trusted Fort Lamy's restaurants. Instead, they ate at home mainly canned goods from the small embassy commissary, and local produce that had uh, the life soaked out of it in lye and frozen meat flown in from South Africa. He left the cafe, walked across the dark, unpaved street to where his driver, Abu, was waiting, dozing over the steering wheel, Chez moi, Abu, s'il vous plaît, he said, probably unnecessarily, since he rarely went any place but home. When he first came, he used to get a big kick out of riding in his official car with the, the small U.S. flags flying from it. But the novelty quickly wore off. There were few paved roads and few places of real interest. Most of the country was desert. And just as the dry desert winds were descending on the capital from the north, so were the winds of change. Slowly and inexorably, Islamic insurgents from the north were advancing on Fort Lamy. Soon the capital and its U.S.-supported dictator would be under siege to the rebels, just as they were to the creeping Sahara. At least, that was what Tom kept saying in reports back to Washington. Reports he suspected. 
accepted that were read with little interest, if they were read at all. <laughs> the story of his career. The residence was a fine old colonial house with a lawn that probably required enough water to supply a small desert village, Tom reflected as he stepped out of the car under the portico. At home, they'd never been able to afford such a house, well, not to mention the servants. Madame Etanho, elle, elle fait des valises, uh, Fatima, the maid, told him. Sheila was upstairs packing. Sometimes it seemed she had been packing and unpacking their whole married life. They had started dating his senior year at Cornell. He had been an English major with vague aspirations to be a writer, much to the chagrin of his dairy farmer father, who wanted him in the ag school. Then Sheila got pregnant. Then a friend told him about the uh, foreign service exam, which was given on campus. He passed. Oh, Sheila was elated. She had never been to Europe, she'd said excitedly. But after the training program in Washington, where Tom Jr. was born, he was assigned to uh, Vientiane. Well, Sheila hadn't minded too much. And they were young and still in love. And Oh, and there were trips to Bangkok, even Hong Kong. Then came Kuala Lumpur and Manila, where their daughter, Susan, was born. By that time, Sheila was sick of smelly, dirty cities in hot, humid countries whose food always made her sick, she said. Then they were transferred to Phnom Penh, where he met Elaine. He should go up and help her pack or you know, at least say hello, but he'd asked uh, Idris, the houseboy, to bring a gin and tonic to the veranda and sat there in one of the rattan chairs. Sheila stayed mainly in the air-conditioned bedroom in the evenings and shunned the veranda, which was not screened against insects. But he loved to sit there and watch the African night close in around him, listen to the chirping of the gecko lizards. À l'heure quand le gecko grammy. That had been the phrase he and Elaine used to uh, fix their clandestine meetings at the hour when the gecko Five o'clock in her apartment near the river, shabby, run down, oh, and paradise. After a magical hour or two with Elaine, a sink, a sink, as the French called such trysts, he could go home and listen to Sheila's litany of complaints with equanimity. He and Elaine fell hopelessly in love, but there was nothing he could do about it. He finally broke it off. He, he told himself it, it was for Elaine's sake. She was young and could meet someone else. But to be honest, he was also thinking about his career. Divorce, uh, commonplace now in foreign service, was frowned upon then scandals were grounds for dismissal. So he had lost Elaine and in due time gained an ambassadorship. Ambassador 
to the dead heart of Africa, he suddenly remembered a question framed in the wall of his long ago Sunday school classroom. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? or his heart. Sheila's high heels kicked down the marble staircase and he rose to go inside and greet her. Good evening, Tom. She said somewhat warmly. Oh, Sheila, dear, you, you look nice, he responded. She had put on a sundress for the occasion, one she probably wouldn't be taking back to Washington, where fall was well underway. But her face was red and blotchy. Oh, yeah, she had obviously been crying. Not over her departure from him or from Fort Lamy, he, he knew. In other circumstances, she would have been thrilled to go home. But uh, she had found a lump in her left breast. And a biopsy showed it, it was malignant. The embassy doctor thought some lymph nodes might be involved, which would be very bad news, but he wasn't certain, and Sheila needed to go home immediately for state-of-the-art diagnostics and treatment. She would be treated at Bethesda, surgery, then possibly chemotherapy, or radiation, or both. A grim prospect, an unknown outcome. You know, at dinner, they spoke mainly of the children and of the complicated logistics of her move. Uh, Tommy was at Cornell and Susan at Deerfield Academy, and Sheila would see them soon. No need for them to come out at Christmas as they had planned. Instead, Tom would go to the States. They had managed to get the tenants out of their home in Arlington, and he was trying to arrange to get there furniture out of storage. She repeated all the instructions about the servants uh, that they had gone over before. How much each got paid, how much to give the cook for shopping. You know, you'll probably eat out most of the time when I'm gone, and you can cut that in half, Sheila said. She had an early plane next morning to Dakar and, and Paris, where she would switch to an American carrier. The driver was waiting, the suitcases loaded in the car, and as they down the silent, hurried breakfast. Nor did they speak as they drove the few miles through the quiet streets to the small airport on the edge of the city. You know, because he had diplomatic plates, they were allowed to drive right onto the tarmac. Abu paid his respects to Sheila, which she acknowledged with a nod, and he went off to have a cigarette and uh, give them some privacy. <laughs> Just think, you're taking off from the same airport as Amelia Earhart, he said. Oh, you know, just to make conversation. The doomed aviator had stopped briefly in Fort Lamy in 1937. Remembering Earhart's fate, he instantly regretted the remark. If I die, you'll, you'll be free to... Uh, Mary, her, no, the, the teacher, Elaine, she burst.
burst out. She had never spoken the name to him before. <laughs> you thought I didn't know. Well, I'm not that stupid, she said, her voice breaking and her eyes filling with tears. You know, this was the cue uh, to take her in his arms, to, to comfort her, to tell her he had always loved her. But he just stared out the window. The dead. received no communication from Elaine since his long ago letter breaking off their relationship, but he had surreptitiously kept up with her through embassy friends. <laughs> he would say he was making inquiries on behalf of her family. That was how he learned she had been teaching in Calcutta. Then two months ago, he got a short letter from a, a friend at the embassy in New Delhi, a, a former colleague who had known them both in Phnom Penh. I thought you would want to know, the letter began. And told him. That Elaine was dead. Drowned at an, an Indian beach resort. Oh, an, an accident, the friend had stressed. But was it? Elaine was a strong swimmer. That weekend they had spent in camp. They, they swam to a small island in the Gulf of Siam. He had literally crawled onto the beach, gasping for breath while Elaine wasn't winded at all. He would have to live with not knowing. A death in life sentence. He uh, <coughs> turned suddenly towards Sheila, hoping she might think the tears in his eyes were for her, but not you, Perry. You're not going to die, Sheila. Don't, just don't talk nonsense, he said briskly. Uh, let, let's go. You're, you're, uh, I think your plane has landed. They did not speak again. Just before she climbed the stairway to the plane, he gave her a perfunctory kiss. As he watched the plane rise in the air, felt a twinge of guilt. Maybe I should have told her that Elaine is dead, he thought. It might Wow, can you see why that won a prize? Well, <clears throat> there's another prize-winning chapter. Nothing Gold Can Stay. This was a finalist in the Tennessee Williams Short Story uh, Contest in 2018. And again, remember, as I pointed out, each of these chapters, which come together to form the whole story, but can be taken individually, starts with an entry from her journal. And you could almost read that journal and ignore the other parts to get a different arc to the story. You're the boss when you read it. Nothing gold can stay from Julia's journal. 
received a hand-painted postcard of what looks like a marsh from Arthur, with a cryptic note saying uh, he had retired to Cape Cod. He, he not we. Oh, that doesn't mean Helene has, has left him. Well, you know, he'd be lost. After Helene left him, vanishing into the midst of China, Bill Harper retired to a cottage in Cape Cod Bay and bought an Irish setter whom he named Isolde, so he could say, Mein Irish Kind, wo weilest du? That's the hauntingly plaintive air from Wagner's opera. Every morning, he would put the dog on the front seat of the car and drive across the narrow peninsula to Nossa Beach and uh, let her run along the shore, chasing the gulls and dancing in and out of the water to retrieve whatever jetsam he threw for her. This morning, the wind was whipping the sand into a frenzy, stinging his eyes with sand and salt so he could uh, barely see. Or was it tears? Tears of regret for the beauty of the beach and the sky and the dog, of the world that would soon be lost to him. In the afternoon, he followed his usual routine, setting up his easel on the deck and trying to capture the afternoon light. That last heart-rending gasp of gold illuminating the marsh before the scene faded and the slowly descending darkness sucked the light and the life out of it. Nothing gold stay, he reflected wryly, a bit like himself. His once dark blonde hair had long since faded to gray. <laughs> a bit like his life. He uh, squeezed out some uh, quinochrome gold and, and made a, a wash and, and gently brushed some of the paper to illustrate the light. But the yellow gold paint mixed with the purples and the greens of the marsh and then muddied, creating what his former art teacher would have called a pig's breakfast. The golden moment had eluded him once again. Sighing, he put the paints away, mixed himself a scotch and water, and returned to the deck to wait for David, his oldest son, his and, and Helene's, an assistant professor of Far East Studies at Harvard, was coming to take the dog. He soaked, lying on the deck, <laughs> twitching, with inscrutable dog dreams, woke up instantly when the, the car approached. Recognizing David, she stopped barking and wagged her tail, thumping it against the railing. Hmm. Funny, thought Harper, watching his son approach. <clears throat> the only thing Asian about him is his walk. David had Caucasian features, but walked like a Chinese scholar. You know, which he was, in a sense. Hi, Dad, he said, somberly. Hi, son. <laughs> you want, want a drink? No, thanks, David demurred, probably thinking of the long drive back to Cambridge, his hope gravitated to the younger man's side, putting her head against his knee. La donna and 
immobile, said Harper, but glad of it. Sloth would have a good home. Any word from your mother? <laughs> An unfortunate segue, but David merely shook his head. When he was posted to Hong Kong, he knew it was a dead end, a, a consolation prize for never having been made an ambassador. The conventional wisdom was that China could take Hong Kong with a phone call if the communist giant didn't want to wait until the 99-year lease was up. But Len was in heaven. They found an apartment overlooking Repulse Bay. But Len spent most of the time visiting her family. Her mother still lived in an old house on the peak, and her brother had a penthouse high above Deepwater Bay. Then there were cousins scattered all over the place, in the new territories, and even in Guangdong province, in the real China. It was one of these cousins who had approached me. <laughs> Would Bill be willing to share certain information with him? Oh, no, nothing, nothing sensitive. Just uh, insights into the Consulate General's thinking on certain issues, economic issues mostly. He would be promoting good relations between China and the United States. And it would make it worth his while. Naturally, Bill refused in no uncertain terms. But Len saw things differently. It's not like before, she said. China and the United States are friends now, and we have all these tuition payments coming up. You know, it was true. Bill's family trust, which had cushioned their foreign service life for so long, had run dry, and Hong Kong was very expensive. In the end, he agreed to pass on some papers. Oh, nothing substantive. Mostly papers marked limited official use or confidential. Certainly. Nothing marked secret or top secret stuff they easily could have learned from the uh, New York Times or even the China Morning Post, he, he rationalized. Modern espionage like piracy seemed to be mainly a matter of, of desk work. The only cloak and dagger aspect of it was a a trash can in the back of a Chinese restaurant in North Point. Throughout his career, there had been rumors, oh, totally unfounded, that he was an undercover CIA operative. Ironic that he was finally, in a sense, fulfilling that myth. But toward the end of his tour, he began to have the uneasy feeling that he was being followed. He said that to Helene. And shortly after that, she, she told him she was going to uh, um, visit a cousin in the new territories. She never returned. He sent in his retirement letter. Mm -hmm. Bought the old brown shingled cottage with the last of his ill-gotten gains and waited. He knew it was only a matter of time. The government had been gentlemanly about it. They 
allowed him to plead guilty to only one count of espionage. What a glamorous, romantic word for such a tawdry, pedestrian deed. His lawyer had negotiated what he assured Harper was a good deal. 30 years in a minimum security prison with possibility of parole in 20. <laughs> he laughed at himself as an 84-year-old ex-con squinting into the sunlight. His lawyer was coming in the morning and would drive him to the federal building in Boston where he would surrender. David, you should go, he urged. It's, it's getting dark. He stood, his son embraced him awkwardly. They had never been a physically demonstrative family. He saw tears in his son's eyes as David put the dog on her lead and walked her to his car. He soaked her, seemed confused. She looked back at, at Harper in, inquiringly, and then at his benedictory wave, hopped into the car. A new adventure! The night air was cold. stayed on the deck. Darkness was obscuring the marsh. Oh, he regretted that he had never captured it in the glory of its magic golden hour. And never would. Perhaps there would be art classes at Allen Wood, he thought. Oh, he heard there were activities like that, a sort of therapy. But golden afternoon light, he suspected, gazing at the last faint outlines of the marsh. It would be in short. Thank you, Anne. And you can get this book at Story and Song and fill in the space between the two chapters that I shared with you. And now, have a wonderful weekend, and I look forward to sharing poetry with you next Wednesday. <laughs>